The intent of this video is to conduct a deep dive of the B-17's crew oxygen life support system. We will also look at crew oxygen usage data. This video is somewhat in response to the Masters of the Air trailer clip showing bomber crew members not wearing their oxygen masks or ripping them off at altitude. This chart from a 1943 document titled Use of Oxygen and Oxygen Equipment outlines U.S. policy with regard to oxygen usage. Crew members were to start using oxygen when at altitudes above 10,000 feet or when flying at night. We will see later, bomber crew members did not take this policy lightly. The Germans and Japanese adopted a high-pressure oxygen system in their aircraft, as discussed on this November 1943 Air Force Journal. The U.S. AAF adopted a low-pressure 400 PSI oxygen system. The low-pressure system is more battle damage resistant, and the oxygen cylinders are less likely to explode. U.S. bombers adopted two types of oxygen system, the old continuous flow and the new on-demand system. Both systems fed from the 400 PSI low-pressure oxygen cylinders. The older continuous flow crew mast used a rebreather bag and the system was replaced in 1943 as the new on-demand oxygen delivery system reduced oxygen consumption by only delivering oxygen when the crew member inhaled and the masts were much less likely to freeze. This image shows a B-17's oxygen system training aid display. Oxygen is stored in either the, either the large G1 cylinders or the smaller F1 cylinders. Characteristics of the plane oxygen storage cylinders are shown on this page from an Army Air Force Aeronautical Equipment Volume 3 document. The larger G1 cylinder holds 29 cubic feet of oxygen and weighs 18 pounds. The smaller F1 cylinder holds 13.8 cubic feet of oxygen and weighs 9 pounds. The B-17 contains 18 G1 cylinders and a single F1 cylinder. As discussed on this 1943 B-17 GenFam manual, the location of the 19 cylinders are shaded in the schematic. This image shows the location of the G1 oxygen cylinders located behind the B-17 cockpit. A single F1 smaller cylinder is mounted to the ball turret's frame. The ball turret's oxygen cylinder needs to be refilled around every 1.5 hours by the waste gunners. The duration of oxygen the cylinders can provide varies with altitude, as shown on this chart. At an altitude of 25,000 feet, the smaller F1 cylinder can sustain a crew member for around 2 hours, and the larger G1 cylinder can sustain a crew member for around 4 hours. The cylinders are designed with longitudinal and hoop welded tear straps. If a cylinder is battle damaged, the oxygen will leak without catastrophic rupture. They are designed to leak before burst. The oxygen is transferred to the A-12 on-demand regulator, as shown in the schematic. The B-17 incorporated four independent oxygen systems for redundancy. The system also included one-way check valves, so if part of the system leaked, there would not be any backflow of oxygen to the damaged part of the system. The oxygen lines terminated at the A-12 on-demand flow regulators. Characteristics of the regulators are shown on this page. It will deliver the correct amount of oxygen by mixing the outside air with the plane's oxygen. It only delivers oxygen on an inhale. It can operate up to 40,000 feet. The on-demand regulator's lever should be in the normal position for proper altitude-based air oxygen mixture. If the lever is switched to 100% oxygen position, then only pure oxygen is supplied to the mask, but only when taking a breath. This position should be used when the cabin is filled with smoke or other toxic gases, so no mixing occurs. The emergency valve bypasses the regulator and provides a continuous oxygen flow. These should be open when reviving a crew member or when your mask is temporarily removed to spit, vomit, or blow your nose. Each crew station has oxygen gauges which provide information that the oxygen is flowing and the system's pressure. When you inhale, the blinker opens up and when you exhale, it shuts. There are 13 A4 walk-around bottles on the B-17 scattered throughout the ship. They provide around 8 minutes worth of oxygen, are refillable, and are used when you need to leave your crew station. These are some images of walk-around bottles in action. An H1 bailout bottle should be used for any high altitude jump. It's a high pressure cylinder with no regulator. The duration of oxygen is also around 8 minutes. One other big advantage of the bailout bottle is it will help inflate your lungs after a parachute opening. Parachute opening shock levels vary between 11 and 33 G's depending on altitude. 
The parachute harness compresses your chest, forcing an exhale, deflating your lungs. The forced air from a bailout bottle will help inflate your lungs after this very shocking event. Oxygen is required to sustain life at high altitude flight. This table from a 1945 21st Bomber Command Air Intelligence Report outlines the effect of high altitude on a human. At an altitude of 30,000 feet, unconsciousness occurs in 60 seconds and death occurs in 20 minutes. This chart from a May 1946 Aviation Medicine and Psychology Report outlines the effect of altitude on night vision. The table indicates the increase in light intensity needed to match sea level values. For example, at an altitude of 10,000 feet, the light intensity will need to be increased by 59% to match your sea level night vision. Peripheral vision is also affected. So how serious did air crews take the recommendations? The results of a B-17 bomber crew oxygen usage survey are documented in the September 1944 Army Air Forces Air Aviation Physiologist Bulletin. At what altitude did you start taking oxygen? The range was from 8 to 12,000 feet with most responses at 10,000 feet. Most gunners found oxygen helped reduce fatigue. Crew members were well indoctrinated in oxygen usage. What is the highest altitude you flew in combat? In 1943 and 44, 34% of crew members attained a maximum altitude at or above 31,000 feet. Did the plane have to turn back due to oxygen? Reasons listed included ball turret recharging hose failed, crew member used regulator's emergency valve and depleted the system. Other gas was in the plane's oxygen system, a leaky regulator. What was the main reason for using a walk-around bottle, or why did you leave your crew station? Relieve oneself, checking on crew members when the interphone is out, rendering first aid, revival of an anoxic crew member. The rate of bomber crew members, both fatal and non-fatal anoxia, as shown on this page from a November-December 1944 Physiologist Bulletin. The x-axis is a month and year. The y-axis and dotted line is the number of anoxia cases per 1,000 bomber sorties. As the war progressed, the number of anoxia cases peaked in November 1943 from 18 to less than 1, just 9 months later. The drop in anoxia is due to both improvement in oxygen equipment and training. The changeover from continuous flow to an on-demand system occurred in 1943. The on-demand system masks adopted were less susceptible to freezing and provide a more reliable oxygen delivery system. This chart lists a B-17 crew member's percent susceptibility to fatal anoxia. The tail gunner was most susceptible at 27% and the pilot and co-pilot were least susceptible at 0%. The ball turret gunners fall in the middle of the pack yet were most susceptible to non-fatal anoxia. Ball turret gunners were more apt for equipment failures, but they are in a better position to be rescued than the tail gunners. Ball turret gunners can be checked on with the intercom and visually through the turret's viewing port. The average duration from last check to anoxia discovery was 7 minutes for the tail gunner. If you found this video informative, please consider engaging by liking, commenting, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.